represents the difference between something that's real and something that's put on. You, know, you play church and a guy like that will just leave. Uh, but they can tell the real thing and the Bible's real, man. It still works. We were talking last time, we left off around verse 15. We talked about how he has feet like unto fine brass as if they were burned in a furnace. Remember that? And his voice is the sound of many waters. We were talking about the power of God and uh, God giving us a view of the Lord in his eternal state and uh, how his voice would sound like thunder, voice would sound like Niagara Falls, just the unbelievable power of Almighty God. And we left off considering uh, the fact that you're going to face him someday. You're going to walk in and you're going to see him eyeball to eyeball and the gravity of that. And we're going to look at some verses on that a little bit more tonight. But that's a pretty sobering thought. When you stop and consider that someday every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Uh, I am not going to stand there and give an account for my wife. Now, now hang on a second. To an extent I will. The extent of how I treated her. The extent of did I not follow God in his orders for me in how I'm supposed to behave in my marriage, right? But I'm not going to give an account for whether or not she did right, read her Bible, uh, did everything God wanted. It, it, I'm not to micromanage her life and worry about her life. I'm to set an environment in my home where my wife and my kids can serve God as much as they want to. Does that make sense? Yeah. My job here is the same thing. I'm to set an environment where you can grow as much as you want to grow. But it's not my job to force you to grow. I'm not going to give an account for whether or not you do or don't grow unless I hampered the environment. I didn't do what I was told to do. You understand that? Now, that's not to say then that I can just let my kids go to hell in a handbasket, let them be doing whatever they want to do, drinking and doping and partying and all the rest of that stuff, living in my house. And I'm like, well, that's up between, that's, no, that's between me and God now because I'm told that I'm to rule my own house well. Does that make sense? So understand those lines. But what I'm trying to say is when I stand before God, I'm not going to give an account for the decisions that they made. They're individuals. I'm going to give an account for myself. Uh, that leads you to that whole thing about not judging your brother. What a confusing subject. And we're not going to dive into it too deep tonight, but I am going to touch on it. There's a line. Uh, he that is spiritual judgeth all things, right? Yet he himself is judged of no man. There's a line there. I've said it over and over again. I don't want to dig into people's personal lives. I stay off social media because I don't want to know. And everybody's not your friend, even if they're on your friend list. Just so you know, some of your friends are just criticizing you, picking you apart, and getting too familiar with you, and familiarity breeds contempt. I don't want to know until I have to know. And when I have to know, it'll be brought to my attention because God will put it on my plate and then I'll have to, there is judgment that has to be passed in the church. I think in 15 years, twice we've told people to leave. I think it's twice. I'm not 100% sure on it. The guys could back me up on it. I think two people we've had to say, you're gone in 15 years. You know how many sinners we've had here? <laughs> Over, you know how many people we've had actively in sin and trying, struggling? I don't want to just bounce people. I don't believe in being overly judgmental. I don't believe in digging into your business. I don't believe in worrying myself about what you do or don't do or how much you do or don't do it or any of that stuff. I don't want to be judging you. I'm told to leave you alone. I'm told that you're going to give account of yourself to God. I'm told that you're going to answer to God yourself. And there's some things you're not going to agree with me on. You understand that? And I'm not going to agree with you. We might have different levels of personal standards on some things. A personal standard. I might think you're crazy for the way you do something. Because God's convicted me about something. And if I do it, it's wrong. But it might not be wrong. Not, blow your mind here. A little bit of Bible. Blow your mind. It might not be wrong for the person next to you, but it's wrong for you. Wait a minute, right is right and wrong is wrong. That's the problem with a lot of Christians. You paint everything with this broad brush and everything's got to always be black and white. That's not necessarily true. Hey, look, hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he in that thing which he alloweth. But he that doubteth is damned if he eat. Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. I've used the illustration. If I look at these shoes, these are my, these are my shoes I need to replace because they're too tame for me. 
but they were the fancy, you know, the fanciest black ones I could find. You ever see my brown shoes? It was like, they're, they're just too much. It's the Italian blood in me. I can't help it. I like, the, I like the bling. I like the fancy shoes. It's just a sin. It's just terrible. You know what I mean? But I, I buy them and I feel good about them. I thank God for them. I don't have a conviction about it. I'm like, I like them. If I was like, you know, are those too fancy for a pastor? If I'm on the platform, is that pulling attention to what I'm wearing as opposed to God? I wonder if I should wear those or not. Ah, I think I'm being weird. You know, I was raised with such strict standards. I think I'm just getting carried away. I don't know. It's no big deal. Just wear them. You know what I just did when I put that shoe on? I just sinned. You know why? Because in my mind, I wasn't sure whether I was okay or not. I took a chance of offending God because I liked the bling and I liked the fancy shoe. You got that? But the next guy puts them on, don't think nothing about him, and doesn't sin. Now, you got to let that sink in for a little while. Because the fact of the matter is, is that you will give a personal account to God. Some people, because the backgrounds they come from have a higher standard than you because they can't mess with something. They, they just got a hang up about it or it just bothers them or it reminds them of the past. Or they got a lower standard than you because they're all right. Nothing's bothering them and it bothers you. Don't worry about them. Not preaching on things that'll hurt the church tonight, but that's one of them. Get your nose in your own cotton picking business and remember that to his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, God's able to hold him up. I've watched God hold people up that I said in my own judgment because I've seen it before, if that continues in their life, they're not going to make it. And it shocks me how God, who knows all things, have I mentioned to you he knew you when you were a substance in your mother's womb? Have I mentioned that to you? He knows everything about them. And he knows everything about you. And so when God's looking down and judging something, God's judging it fairly. His eyes are as a flame of fire. He's looking down deep into your soul. I guarantee you, when you look on those eyes, man, you, it, you are, you are going to melt inside. Because he is God. You won't be able to hide nothing. Well, I didn't kill him. The sword of the children of Ammon. No, you did. I mean, you're going to hide nothing when it comes to you and God, and you're going to stand before him someday, and that's a scary thought to me. So I want to spend a little bit more time getting to know him and understanding him and understanding his word and praying and being sensitive to what he wants from me or doesn't want from me. Because I'm going to answer to a holy and a powerful and almighty God, and that scares me. And I want to spend a little less time, and it's hard because as a pastor, you're very much into other people's lives. You, you do understand that, right? I mean, it's, it's, you're investing in the life of people for a long time, over a long haul, slow and steady. And, and it's seeing their growth and their benefit. That is the, the, the human or the earthly, the, the kickback for what you do. Do, do. do you understand what I'm saying? To see people growing is very encouraging to a pastor. And, and then to see people go in the wrong direction or having things in their life that, oh, I wish it wasn't that way. And that's probably not going to turn out well. And I really wish they'd ask me about that, but they don't ever want to ask me about that. But I wish we could talk about that. It, it's hard for even a preacher. Do you understand what I'm saying? Maybe even harder than the average church grower to say, you know what? They're going to answer to God and I'm going to answer to God and I'm going to leave them alone and try to help them get where God will take them and wherever they want to get with God. But you need to consider that for yourself. You're going to answer to God himself. Let's keep looking at him. That's my little introduction. We'll hopefully, Lord willing, wrap this chapter up tonight. Don't forget those feet are like unto fine brass and fine brass is a type of judgment. That's what we've been talking about. And it says as if they were burned in a furnace. Boy, what a blessing it was today to be able to explain to Lewis that God went down there. He descended first. And he paid your sin debt. He took your judgment. Boy, what a blessing, huh? What a great thing to have a God like that. And then his, his voice is as a sound of many waters in verse number 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. We'll come back to those stars in just a little bit. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Go back with me to 2 Samuel. I want to show you something this morning. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp two-edged sword, right? 2 Samuel chapter 12, where we were this morning. Let me show you something that's very interesting. And I've, I've beat this point half to death, but I'm going to back it up tonight uh, and just kind of show you something that God had showed me. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 9. 
in the judgment that Nathan's bringing to David for what he had done, he says, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight, right? So God had given a commandment, and the commandment was, Thou shalt not commit adultery. It was written down. David, who can quote Exodus chapter 22, like we talked about this morning off the top of his head, I'll guarantee you he knew the Ten Commandments by heart. I mean, he's quoting Exodus 22. How many sheep should you give for a sheep? He knows, he knows his Bible that well. After being backslid for a year to a year and a half, backslidden on God, and he could quote Exodus 22 off the top of his head like that, you tell me he didn't know the Ten Commandments? Sure he did. What did he despise? He despised the commandment of the Lord. That's the writings, right? Look down at verse number 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house. And boy, that was the case. At 65 years old, he's fighting a battle and that giant's about to kill him and his guys have to come in and, and, and defend him and pull him out of that fight because he's about to get killed. He fought all the way to the finish. The sword didn't just, just in his house, but in his own, his own house. He had battles. He fought all the way to the end when God would have given him peace. Now look at this. Because thou hast despised me. Well, what did it say in verse 9? You despise the commandment. Then in verse 10, God said, you despise me. When you despise the word of God, you're despising God. All these people that talk about, you know, loving Jesus and loving God and, you know, all this kind of stuff, but correct the Bible... Preachers that tell you they love God and, you know, oh, it's about the Lord and it's about God. It's about Jesus and the spirit this and love that and all the rest of this tomfoolery. But then they get up and they say that's an unfortunate rendering. That's an error in your Bible. You got to know that when they despise the commandment of God, they're directly despising God himself. It's an asinine thing to me to consider that a man would believe that God could speak the worlds into existence in six literal days, but he couldn't keep a perfect book in your lap. That makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. There's, there's an intellectual dishonesty there. While they claim to be the smart guys, they're fools. Out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, and on his thigh is written the Word of God. That tells you how serious God takes his word. When David denied the Bible and sinned against the Bible, he directly sinned against God. If Jesus Christ was standing in front of some of you kids and said, don't laugh at that joke in the cafeteria at school, don't look at that on your friend's phone. If Jesus was standing there, eyes as a flame of fire, feet burning like brass, hair white as wool, and almighty God looked at you and said, don't. You wouldn't. I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now, you wouldn't. But he doesn't do that, does he? He sits you down in church on Sunday and puts some little preacher up there to preach at you and stomp his feet and spit and quote Bible verses at you. And the Spirit of God tells you what to do, 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 and then you go do the opposite. You didn't just despise the Bible. You didn't just despise the preaching. You despised God personally. Think about that for a minute. Some of you kids, unfortunately, I hope to God it's not true, but if statistics are accurate, some of you kids are going to grow up, and in a few years, you're going to be gone. Some stupid little zit-faced boy is going to come along and drag some of you girls out of here. And you know better. You're despising God personally over some zit-faced boy that's going to break your heart. I, I love you, but you're a fool. Some of you boys, you, you're going you're gonna to lose your cotton picking mind, and you know better. Some stupid little kid at school is going to influence you and pressure you to do something God doesn't want you to do, and he's told you not, and the preacher's preached at you, and your parents have preached at you, and your conscience is telling you, and the Holy Spirit of God is inside of you going, don't! And you're like, shut up. You're despising God. Now you're going to face him someday. That's scary to me. And you're looking at eternity. You're not looking at maybe three score and ten. Or if by reason of strength, four score. Who wants to make it much past 80? I don't know that I want to be 100. Okay? <laughs> that 90 to 100 run doesn't seem like a real happy run. <laughs> That's a short life. I know it feels like an eternity if you're under, well, you know, I don't know, whatever, if you're a kid. It feels like an eternity. It ain't that long. You're going to face him. 
Go to Hebrews chapter 4. You know the verse, but let's look at it anyways. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. Hebrews 4, 12. The best thing I can do for you, the absolute best thing I can do, is give you so much Bible and repeat it and repeat it and preach it and quote it and preach it and quote it and repeat it and repeat it and illustrate it and drive it in and emphasize it so that if and when you do decide you're going out there, you're so caught and picking and miserable, you can't take it anymore. The Holy Spirit of God's quoting verses at you while you're at the party. Just make you an insane, I mean, just nuts, just unable to enjoy any of it. I mean, just get drunk and then just fall out crying and miserable and hate yourself and convicted and just wallowing in your cotton pick and misery, grieving the spirit of God. I want to put so much Bible in you that you just have to, you have to spit in the face of the light to go down the wrong road. Because that's the best chance we got of getting you back. Yeah. And the best chance we got of even keeping you from going is to preach and to give you the Bible. You know why? Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Folks, I don't care if this is 2021 or 23 or whatever we're at now, a 21st century. I don't care what the modern church is doing and what you supposedly have to do with music and have to do with programs and all that stuff to build a church. I'm telling you right now, that verse is still as accurate today as it was in the 1800s and the 1600s and whatever else you want to call the good old days. That verse is, an ac is as accurate today as the day it was penned down. You understand what I'm saying? The Word of God is still quick. And it's still powerful and it's still sharper than any two edged sword. What comes out of his mouth? A two edged sword. That's a wild thing, isn't it? Piercing even to the, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. You know why some people get so mad when you preach the Bible to them? You'll bring visitors in, and I'll promise you right now, like me and Brian were talking about before church, you are not going to bat a thousand. We were talking about it. I, I, if there, I mean, everybody that I've ever spent time with or invested in over the last 15 years, I, mean, I know we've had hundreds come through. Look at the success ratio. I mean, good night, man. It's taken 15 years to get where we were this morning. It is a blessing where we were this morning. I mean, we needed the overflow chairs. Hallelujah. Glory to God, right? 15 years it's taken. That's a pretty wild thing. That's a long time. You know what this book is? The reason so many of them don't want it, because they come in and they get cut. Folks, I can watch it, and I, and I would never go so far as to say I know exactly what was going on, but I, I think I've been doing it long enough to where I can watch it sometimes, and I'm preaching, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I am so in those visitors. I've never met them before. I'm not saying this happened, you know, anytime recently. I'm saying I've seen this. I've never met him before, don't know him from Adam, but somehow or another we're so in their personal business, they can't take it anymore. Years ago, a couple sat back over here where Rob and Deb are and started fighting during the service and kept fighting the whole time. The problem was I was all over his case. She tried to step out at the altar call to come forward and he physically blocked her. I mean, it was, a, it was starting a war over there. I had no idea what I was even saying. I was just preaching, expository preach. I wasn't on a topic and kicking some kind of a hobby horse. I was preaching an expository message like I was taught to preach, going down through the passage and preaching the Bible. And a, and a war's breaking out. You know what that is? That's God getting so down in your personal business with that Bible and touching on something you don't want him to touch, cutting away your thoughts and your motives and your intents, going down all the way to the deepest points of who you are and dealing with what needs to be dealt with. That is the power of the Word of God, and it is so connected to Jesus Christ that if you reject one, you reject the other. Yet there is no, there is no, oh, I love Jesus and I worship Jesus and Jesus, Jesus, and my God, my Jesus, and what's the Bible? Where's that in the Bible? I don't read my Bible. I don't know my Bible. I can't turn to that in my Bible. But me and Jesus are so close. I'm so close to Jesus. You're close to some kind of spirit. You got some kind of a warm and fuzzy feeling and something is lying to you, I mean, up one side and down the other and it's got you so messed up because if you don't walk with God according to the Bible, if you're not learning who Jesus Christ is according to the Bible, you don't know you got the right Jesus. That Bible is so important in your life. It, it, it's crucial in your life. And when you reject the commandment of God, you reject God himself. Back over to Revelation, you get the point. It determines the intents of the heart. Ain't that funny? 
like we're talking about this morning. Now, I, I, I didn't kill him myself. Yeah, you set the whole thing up so that he would die. It was the intention of your heart when you went through that process. So, so many people know how to commit the act but keep their hands clean. Right. Now I'm Pilate washing my hand. It's the intent of the heart. Pilate, your problem is you sold out the truth when you knew the truth. You sold it out because you were more worried about your career and your political influence and your money and your nice car and your nice house and all that you had going for you, your nest egg and your future. You were more worried about that than you were the fact that you knew the truth and your wife knew the truth. And God gave you a chance, and you denied. It's the intent of the heart that the Bible gets to. And that's why a lot of people don't like Bible preaching. I, I'll, I will say this, and I mean this as a compliment, and from my heart, it's not patronizing. When you walk in here with your husband, your wife, and your kids, and you sit down under Bible preaching that's straight, and you take it week after week, month after month, year after year, you have some backbone. Come on, fellas, you're not going to sit there and tell me that I've never preached a message on loving your wife like Christ loved the church and trying to ever give her the, <coughs> trying to ever give her the, <coughs> trying to hand the, <coughs> you understand what I'm saying? Come on, man, you're going to watch Wind Calls the Heart. <laughs> she ain't getting the remote, she lost her mind, right? Okay, okay, honey, are you going to tell me you ever sat through services like that, convicted, and she's like trying not to do that, you know? Our ladies flip the shoe to the other foot. You have ever sat here under conviction and your husband, your wife, your kids know, the kids, your parents know. Parents preaching on something and you're like, he's talking about being consistent. These brats know I don't like getting out of my chair. They've been working me over for months, man. They're getting away with murder and he's just right. And they know I'm that. You see, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It takes character to come and sit here. It takes a heart that says, I do want God and I want the truth more than I care about my own pride. I don't care if you come to the altar calls or not. You have character if you keep coming and sitting here. That's a good thing. Respond to it. Why? Because you love the Lord. The Word of God's uh, intertwined with the Lord Jesus Christ so much so you can't separate the two. Now, notice something else about that sharp two-edged sword. i got to move because we got to finish this chapter tonight. I'm in a little bit of a preachy mood. Can you tell? I'm feeling better. <laughs> um, notice something else. His countenance says, The sun shineth in his strength. That's how bright his face is. I need to show you a passage here real quick. Go over to Malachi chapter number 4. I want to show you this. It's pretty interesting. And then I'll just, I'll, I'll just kind of give you a, a couple other references. We won't turn to them, but I'll just mention them to you. The Bible says in Psalms that the Lord is a son and strength. And when it says a son, it says S-U-N in the King James Bible. Like, like the sun that rises and the sun that sets. It refers to God as a son, S-U-N. Now, you know, I'm so glad there's really intelligent people that can help us with all the errors in the King James Bible and they make the English grammar work better. I'm really glad that they're there uh, because there's a lot of people that want to lie. And so it makes it easier for people that want to lie to read those Bibles. And what they do in the intents of the heart gets hidden under, well, it's really hard to understand that old English. But the real intention of the heart is that King James Bible forces me to slow down and get out a dictionary and look it up and scratch my head and reread the verse and look up other verses, it forces me to work. It forces, you know what? Heaven forbid, I mean, God forbid, we should ever have to stop and think about something. We Google it to get the answer. You understand what I'm saying? I don't want to go to school. I don't want to have to commit to driving all the way to church and sitting there and listening and asking questions and writing down. I just get confused. So give me an easier Bible to understand. The intent of the heart is you really don't want to know and you really want something that's easy and quick like your microwave dinners. You go ahead and eat them, but they'll put a little extra on you. You may not want on you and they'll give you cancer too because they got stuff in there that ain't supposed to be in a human body. Or you can go through the work and get the real thing. Now Malachi chapter 4, check this out. Look at verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear his name. Is that you? Yeah. I've been trying to help you. I've been telling you how powerful he is. 
I've been telling you you're going to see him. I've been telling you you're going to answer to him. But unto you that fear his name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Look at the Son. It's capital S U N. Now, what's funny to me is all the new Bibles leave that, the ones I looked up. But what they did is they helped us out with the grammar. Because when we come along there, the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in its wings. You know what your King James Bible says? His wings. You know why? The Son of Righteousness is the Lord Jesus Christ, and that thing's talking about the second advent. It says the Son... Now you run the other references. The Lord is a sun and a shield. And you can keep looking. Psalm 119, as the sun, right? In Psalm 119, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a strong man to run a race, he rises in the morning, it sets at night. He rises again. That whole thing's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty. He spoke the sun into existence. And you go over there to the book of Revelation in the end, and you know what you'll find out when we go through there? There's no need of a son. Because the lamb is the light. His face is so powerful and so bright in a human body standing in his presence, you could not survive. You're going to need a glorified body just to go there. Just to exist. People tell you, I got caught up into heaven. <laughs> yeah, right. You'd be burnt to a crisp. You couldn't handle the brightness of Jesus Christ. You couldn't handle looking into that face that close. And someday we're going to see him. Verse number, uh, verse number 17. And when I saw him, I talked about this a little bit last time. I fell at his feet as dead. And he had laid in his right hand, he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. That to me scares me. When John got caught up and he saw him, he just falls down in front of him as, as a dead man. Like everything just shut off. No power to even stand there. You know, you're told you can come boldly to the throne of grace right now. I mean, you can run right into the throne of grace and drop down on your knees and just start talking to God. Like a kid with their dad, right? When it comes to dad, they don't need an appointment. They're my kids. So, I mean, I don't just let them randomly interrupt me if I'm in a busy, but, but let's say something's really going wrong, some, really a problem. When I'm in counseling meetings, I, that phone buzzes. I try to turn it to silent, but I've got the, the vibration thing going on. And I just check to make sure it's not my wife or my daughters. If it's my wife or my daughters, I usually respond. Um, unless it's like, can we watch TV or something like that that doesn't need to be answered. But other than that, I, I respond. Because they're, they're my kids, she's my wife. The door's open. You, you know the door's open to you in prayer? You go boldly into the throne of grace and drop on your face and beg God for help, beg Him for mercy, beg Him for forgiveness, talk to Him. Do you ever talk to God about stuff that's bothering you? Like, really, like, honestly, like, like, go ahead and be unspiritual with God. I, I'm not saying be sacrilegious or disrespectful or irreverent. I'm saying, have you ever gone and said all those things to God that you wouldn't say to somebody else because it sounds so selfish and unspiritual? You, you know, you should. Like, he doesn't already know. Like, he doesn't understand your wants and your needs and your desires. I, I, I literally do, I do go to God with my wants. Say, Lord, I, you know, I, now, if I'm wrong on this, not my will, but thine be done. I'm content with taking a no on some of this stuff. But, but here's where my heart's at. You know, I feel good sometimes about just being honest with him. Because he already knows anyhow. That's how boldly you can go to God. That's a pretty, it's a pretty cool thing. You know, when you walk into the judgment I really don't believe it's going to be like that. I don't think we're going to have the same kind of a carefree. I think when we actually get there and see him, I really believe this is the way we're going to respond. I wonder, I don't know, I, I don't, and I'm not making a doctrinal statement on this. 
I wonder if the whole body of Christ at the judgment seat is just going to be laid out flat on their faces, just all of us. Just laying down flat. Waiting for our name to be called. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just sanctified imagination kind of thing. You, you do whatever you want with it. But let me show you a couple of biblical examples, if I could, about some men that stepped into the presence of God and how they responded. Go to Ezekiel chapter number 1, please. Talking about some pretty solid guys. Talking about John. Laid his head on the breast of Jesus Christ at supper, the beloved disciple. Talking about Ezekiel. A pretty solid prophet, huh? I mean, if you were, if you were Ezekiel and you walked in the room... I'll pretty much guarantee you, I'd be like, hey, you know, I know you're a preacher, instant in season, out of season, you're up. No, no, brother, you preach, you preach. Oh, no, no, I ain't preaching with you sitting there, you're up. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? The level of like, this guy knew God pretty close to the Lord, wrote a whole bunch of your Bible. Well, the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 1, and look at verse 28, as the appearance of the bow that was in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, when he saw the likeness of the glory of the Lord, when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. When he saw the likeness of the glory of the Lord, he fell flat on his face. Pretty holy man. Pretty solid guy. Pretty, hey man, I've been serving the Lord my whole life and I've been doing right and I'm preaching, I stand for what's right and uh, I just, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to take my judgment like a man. Hopefully there's some good there. You know, when God puts the fire to it, it purifies gold, silver, and <laughs> He said, when I saw the likeness of the glory of God Almighty, I was flat on my face. You know the difference between that and falling backwards, right? I taught you that before. In the garden, I am he. Which way did they fall? Ain't that interesting? You go ahead and run that through the Bible. When they fall backward, they got a, another spirit in them. When they're facing the spirit of God and they see his power, they see his glory, it knocks them back. Now, if you know your Bible and you're watching some of these charismatics to put their hands on people and heal them, and every time it's the Spirit of God, you know, they're falling, bow, and knock it. Why are they all falling backward? Because according to the Bible, they got a bad spirit in them that's not connected to the spirit that guy claims that he has. God will show you that stuff if you know your Bible. I mean, you might, you might not always even be able to nail it down, but something in you is like something's wrong. Because if you've been in the Bible long enough, it's back there in your mind. It's been put into your head. It's in your heart. It's running back there somewhere in your brain. However all that stuff works, but you've read it, and it's back there somewhere. And I'm telling you, if you put it in, the Holy Spirit knows how to pull it out at the right time. You just, I just have a hard time understanding it. I'll keep putting it in because you're going to need it. You're investing in a bank, and you're going to need that withdrawal sooner or later. That kind of thing, that, that something ain't right about that. Why? Well, every time they face Jesus Christ, they fall backward. So God's just giving everybody an example that they ain't the right thing. They're claiming the name of Jesus, but they're not even acting the right way according to the Bible. A holy man, a man seeking God, a man trying to walk with God, a man trying to do right, a man that loves God and worships God and is in tune with God's Spirit so much so that God's speaking to a holy man of God and he speaks as he's moved by the Holy Ghost and is pending down the inspired words of God. When he sees the likeness of the glory of God, he falls flat on his face, just like John in Revelation. Now look at another one. Go over with me to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel's a pretty solid one, huh? I mean, uh, he had a tremendous amount of wisdom. Daniel can pray and a war's going on in heaven for three weeks. And Lucifer's coming in there trying to intercept the prayers. Lucifer intercepting the prayers of Daniel. I'd say he hit a pretty high level in his walk with God, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'd say Daniel had a little something. Uh, a little something most of us don't have. Talking to one of my friends this week, I'm not even sure who it was. It'll come to me in a second, and I won't say it. But talking to one of my friends this week, and, and uh, there's a little clip of Ian Paisley. He wasn't even a Baptist. Uh, Ian Paisley, he was the only preacher ever in my 
entire time at Bob Jones University for two years, the only preacher that ever visited us in chapel and got my attention and held my attention that I had respect for. That old man could preach. And he fought the Roman Catholic Church like, like no man's business. He was an Irishman. And there was just something about, something about, in the little clip I sent some of my friends, he said something about, uh, I, I'd rather have empty pews in the presence of God than a full church without God, you know? And uh, something about the way some of them old guys preached. Uh, they had something. They had something that our generation desperately needs but doesn't seem to have. I'm telling you, Daniel had it. Uh, if anybody could stand tall with their head bowed before God, it would be Daniel. But in Daniel chapter 8, verse number 17, So when he came near where I stood, and when he came I was afraid. And I fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, old man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Daniel said, I got scared to death. And I fell on my face. Daniel. Daniel. There ain't a person in this room with a smartphone who's seen a hundred thousand images that Daniel never saw in his whole life. You get my point? That's going to actually lay eyes, those eyes that have seen so many things, even at oftentimes in the generation you're in without even being wicked and go on your, out of your way to see it. And those eyes lay eyes on a holy God. You think you're going to stand there? I, I don't think so. Back to Revelation chapter 1. I don't think so. When I saw him in verse 17, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. You know the first thing the Lord said after he rose from the dead? Fear not. He was speaking to his disciples. You know how great that is? You know you're going to need him to say fear not. You know, I'll bet you anything there's going to be a peace flood your soul when he says fear not. You ain't going to hell. The price has been paid. I got you. But we got some accounting to do. Every one of us shall give a Knowing therefore, I didn't take you the verse for the sake of time. Knowing therefore, the terror of the Lord. Do you know what the context is? It's the judgment seat of Jesus Christ for saved people. You say, what does that mean? I'm not teaching you what that means. Do you know I've heard so much unbelievably goofy teaching on that? Everybody's wanting to make a name for themselves nowadays. Because they can't preach their way out of a wet paper bag. Excuse me. So they start a YouTube channel and try to find something in the Bible. I'm not finding anything in the Bible that nobody else found. I'm just, just, it's just advanced. It's a continual unfolding of advanced revelation. <laughs> the intents of your heart are pretty obvious. You're hiding behind a smoke screen. Because you're rephrasing the wording to make it sound like you're not doing what you're actually doing. I mean, some said God's going to bend them over their knee and spank them. Spank us. I mean, I mean like, What? what? Where do you get that in the Bible? You know, spare the rod, spoil the child. Okay, goofball, get out of here. I don't know what it means. I can't tell you what it means. I know that it says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. I know that when I study my Bible and find good men that stand before a holy God and see him, they fall flat on their face. I know that God couldn't show Moses anything but his hinder parts because Moses couldn't handle it. And Moses was really close to God. I know that there's something, I mean, it's, it's going to be awesome. I know that. Not in a slang sense, like truly like awe-striking, awesome, fearful. We'll be on our face, and I'm thankful that I got a God that says, fear not. Man, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, you, 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 I, I, I'd lose my cotton-picking mind. I could not believe in God. I could not believe in this God, the God of the Bible, without his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, having made a way for me. There is absolutely, you, you, workspace salvation, you lost your mind. You're going to have a holy God judge you based on your works? No way, man. You, you can have all that. I'll take the blood of Jesus Christ. I'll take the Alpha and Omega. I'll take the first and the last. At verse number 18, I'm he that liveth and was dead. Well, he died for me. How'd he die? 
the wages of sin, right, is what? So proof you're all sinners is you're all getting old. Well, I'm only 15. You're getting old. Last year you were 14. Next year you're going to be 16. You have an appointment. Every last one of you has an appointment with a grave because you're sinners. Now, if you never sinned, you know you'd never die. How did Jesus die? He never sinned. He became sin for us. Your sin killed your Savior. See, that's why I'm against a crucifix. He became sin for us. You keep that crucifix up there, you're saying, look at the Jesus that became sin. He ain't still sin. I resent that. I resent the insinuation of walking around with a crucifix on your neck. He ain't, my Savior ain't still sin. He, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead and I'm alive forevermore. Boy, thank God for that. He's the only one that ever raised himself from the dead. If he can raise himself from the dead, he can raise you. That's nothing. That's nothing. That's like if he can speak the worlds into existence, he can give you a perfect Bible. It's nothing. It's so simple. I mean, the Lord raising me from the dead. I, I don't, I'm not staying in the grave. My soul ain't sleeping in the grave. He's alive forevermore, and thank God for that. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now, I got a lot on that, but I'm not going to run all the references. Um, first of all, you already know this, but hell is a very real place. It, I, 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 don't give, I don't give two hoots for these, these no hellers. If there's no hell, there ain't no need for Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? I, I don't give two hoots for these, uh, what are they called, um, uh, universalists. You know, eventually Satan's going to pay his dues and he's going to come out of hell and we're all going to be re reunited with God and all this kind of... Show me that. I don't believe these, I don't buy these idiots that think that you're going to just eventually burn up in hell. You're not there eternally. You know, some Bible believers even teach foolishness like that. They, you know what the problem is? They can't handle the just judgment of God. It bothers them too much to think about somebody suffering for eternity. It doesn't bother them at all to think about Jesus Christ going down there and, and putting your sin in hell and rising again and taking the sin of the whole world upon himself. That doesn't bother them at all. It doesn't bother them at all that Almighty God would give his son for his enemies knowing that the vast majority of them would reject him anyhow. That doesn't bother them at all. That's a pretty harsh judgment for God to put on his son, ain't it? I want you to go take their sin on yourself. I want you to pay their sin debt and most of them are going to spit in your face and pay for it anyways on their own. That's pretty harsh. So why wouldn't a just God balance the thing out to say, if you don't trust my son as your savior, if you deny the light, if you deny the conviction, if you refuse to follow the truth, if you're so arrogant and self-righteous and self-conceited as to go it your own way and not seek the truth, when I give all of you a chance, I give every one of you a chance, then you will spend eternity in the lake of fire. That's just to me. That's harsh. Well, it's just just. It's fair. Jesus Christ went down there. He passed through all that mess for you and I. He comes up the third day, and guess what he's got? He's got the keys of hell and of death. He's standing there. Listen, he's standing there with literal keys. Do you know how, you know Matthew 16, hell has, hell has gates, don't you? I mean, I can just see the Lord rising again the third, you know, the third day. He's done with his tour down there and he's bringing the captivity captive hell's a prison you know that right I got a whole list of references that we didn't have time to get to tonight hell's a prison hell's in the center of the earth hell's burning hot hell's got gates and bars on it it's a prison Jesus Christ walks out opens up that door turns around shuts that door clink clink locks that thing rattles the keys and up, up he goes <coughs> That's power. That's, that's power. That's who you're going to be answering to someday. Thank God he holds the key. You know why I'm glad he holds the key? Because if he's given me eternal life and he's paid my sin debt and he's locked that thing up, nobody can put me there. Nobody can put me there. 
because my Savior holds the key. What a sight that's going to be. Verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The things which thou hast seen, chapters 1 to 3 of the book of Revelation. The things which are, chapters 4 to 19. The things which shall be hereafter, chapter 20 through the end, 22. You see how the book breaks down? I showed you repeatedly in the first chapter, he breaks the book of Revelation down. He shows you how to rightly divide it. This is what John is told to write. Now watch it, watch it. Here's what I want you to write, John, when you write the revelation of St. John the Divine, right? Here's how I want you to write it. So John writes it the way God says to write it, and he writes it in three sections. You follow me? We don't make up rightly dividing. It's specifically laid out for us, and when you let the Bible be the Bible and just study the Bible, then it makes things so plain and so clear and so much easier than religion makes it. Or then your mind will tell you it is when you go to read it. Oh, this is just so hard to understand. Like, the problem is you're superficially reading the Bible. The problem is it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. The problem is maybe, maybe, I'm just could be one of the problems. You're not praying before you read your Bible. Who teaches the Bible? Who's the teacher? Yeah. Would it not maybe be pretty important for us to at least take... 20 seconds to stop and say, God, would you open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law? Lord, you're the teacher of this book, and I'm humbling my heart, my mind, myself, everything that I am to you, and I'm asking you from this book to speak to me. You know, it's pretty awesome when God does it. I had a particularly good week. It's not like this all the time, but three days in a row, reading through Isaiah, Three days in a row, God specifically spoke to me about specific things that I really wanted him to speak to me about. It doesn't happen like that all the time. You can't live there. But boy, when it happens, whew, it'll keep you going for a while. He's the one that wrote it. He's the one that teaches it. And he tells us how to study it. And it's right there in 19 that tells you how to break down the, the book of Revelation. Now verse number 20. This is all so weird. Like the seven candlesticks and what? Well, hang on a minute. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. Watch. What's the mystery? The seven stars are angel, or the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Just explained it. It's literally that simple. He's seeing the candlesticks, and God says, okay, those candlesticks are the seven churches that we're going to start talking about in chapter numbers, chapters 2 and 3. Those are the candlesticks. Well, what are the stars in your hand? Those are angels that represent those individual churches. Really? Yeah. Literally. Do you know the Bible says children, it's angels, behold the haste of the Father? You know what an angel is? It can be. It's a representation as you study your Bible, children have representatives before God. Their, their angel always beholds the face of our Father. Man, I would not want to be a pedophile when it comes to Judgment Day. I would not want to be a negligent parent when it comes time to answer to God. I would not want to be a selfish parent. I wouldn't want to love my kids for me. Do you know how many parents love, I mean... Quote, good parents love their kids for their self. They spoil them. They give them what they want. They won't ruffle their feathers. They won't tick them off. They won't make them mad. They won't discipline them. My little babies. Yeah, well, you better be real careful when it comes to kids. That verse scares me. Well, you know, you're taking, maybe I am taking it wrong, but it scares me. Those churches have an angelic representation before God. You know what angels in your Bible? All the way through. Don't have time to run the references because I'm letting you go and we're stopping here. We'll pick it up in chapter 2 next time. You know when you run the references on angels in your Bible, they're always male. They don't have wings. I can show you a passage where there's a couple female angels and they're demons. They're demons. 
angels in the Bible show up, and they show up as men every single time, and they're a holy thing, and they don't have wings or any of the rest of the foolishness you see reading the pictures or watching the reading the religious literature or any of the rest of that stuff. Then people don't know their Bible. They, they just got this wild imagination. They're not little babies with, you know, wings flopping off their back kind of. That's, that's just wild imagination stuff. It ain't Bible. Those, ch those churches have angelic representations before God. And that's an interesting thought. All right, we'll leave it right there, and we'll pick it up next week into chapter number two, and uh, we'll start trying to make a little bit better timing. I won't drag it out forever. Let's go ahead and pray tonight, and we will be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for writing us such a great Bible. Thank you for giving us a, a little preview into who you are. And I pray, God, that we would humble our hearts before you, that we would take you seriously, that we would recognize what a great thing we have in Lord Jesus Christ and we could never stand before a holy God without Him. And I just thank you for my Savior. I thank you for my mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Thank you for the Lamb of God that's taken away my sin. Lord, I thank you so much that I'm part of the bride of Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, you'd come quickly and get us out of here. Uh, but Lord, help us in the meanwhile. If you don't, I pray, God, I beg you, Father, help us. To be in that book and to recognize that our attitude toward the Bible is nothing more than a truth of our attitude toward you. Help us to learn to obey you, to humble ourselves before you, to submit ourselves to you. And I pray, God, you'd prepare not only myself, but you'd prepare everybody here. Lord, all the folks that I love and that I care about, I pray, God, you'd prepare us to stand before you one day at the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ and God, that there would be something left that would bring honor and glory to your name. Lord, it's a wild thing in my mind that you reward us for what you actually do in us and through us. It's just a wild thing. But help me to get out of your way so that you can do whatever you want to do with my life. And I pray that, Lord, you get a hold of the hearts of the folks here. I pray especially for the young folks, Lord. We live in a world that really wants to carry them away. I pray you get the word of God down into them, get it deep in them. And help it to bring forth fruit, Lord, throughout the rest of their lives. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, folks, thanks for being here. You're dismissed.